Well, hello. So uh, today we're going to talk about uh, obviously cybersecurity, but it's good to see everyone. Everyone having a good time? It's good. So uh, we're going to talk about avoiding a data breach. Just a little bit about me. So um, I'm like a bean counter smashed with an engineer. I'm a I'm a CPA. Um, my undergrad was in engineering. I got my master's of science in finance and accounting. Uh, sat for the CPA exam. For 15 years, I did things like due diligence, um, everything from financial statement prep to internal audits. Um, focused a lot on internal controls, a lot of due diligence work. Um, I am a uh, advisor and board member on a few different companies and organizations, and I speak on cybersecurity uh, at several conferences. So it's good to be here. Today I'm going to talk about um, just a few of the statistics um, with cyber, the threat landscape, uh, the real cost of a data breach, not just to the client but to the company, and, and talk a little bit about the four facets of cybersecurity as we talk about building a cybersecurity strategy inside any organization, regardless of the size or the industry. We're going to talk about really what the four key facets are. Um, we're going to get into identity and access management. Um, that is on the prevention side of the equation. It, it always starts there. And then um, we'll talk a little bit about the solution that we have created um, to solve this problem. And then we'll get into some Q&A. So I would absolutely say without a doubt that we are in a cyber war. And every organization, regardless of the size, regardless of the industry, is at risk and frankly is under attack. And, and we've seen just three large um, wide-scale breaches over the past week. And um, most of those are always publicized. We hear about them instantly. And the reason for this has to do with what's happening on the dark web. It also has to do with what countries are now doing with state-sponsored cyber terrorism, not just to wreck networks like we heard about yesterday, but to steal and monetize information in such a way that has to do with two things. Number one is evolving economies, right? And so we see this um, where countries such as China um, will utilize intellectual property to advance the speed at which they innovate or create factories and new technologies. Um, we also see it to disrupt the political ecosystem, right? To help with swaying um, and creating dissension within a populace such as the United States. So 70% of all security breaches go undetected for the first 12 months. That's 70%. So most often, when there's a breach, like a zero-day attack, most of the time, the company doesn't even realize that hackers have been in their system stealing droves of information for upwards of a year. 47% of all American adults have had their personal information exposed by hackers. Now, we've normalized out the Equifax breach, because that was far more pervasive. That was 200 plus million. But suffice it to say that this year alone, it was 47%. Now, 90% of employee passwords in any company, on average, can be cracked in six hours or less. And there's a pervasive problem. And the pervasive problem isn't through malice or malintent. It has to do with the fact that we as humans have some inherent problems with remembering passwords and creating high-strength random passwords for every website, system, and application that we use. Today, um, our products protect about 2 billion plus passwords, and the average person in a company has to transact with roughly 130 different passwords, codes, um, that they transact with every day. So if I said to you, can you remember these, and can you create a high-strength random password, for all 130 and prevent the reuse of the same password in that populace of 130, the answer would be absolutely not. I mean, I don't have the brain of an elephant, right? So at the end of the day, it winds up creating internal control problems. So we also know that bad personal security impacts job security. So when there's a pervasive breach, people lose their jobs. Now, they don't necessarily lose their jobs because they didn't do a good job as a CISO or CIO or an IT admin, that's part of it, and we've seen that with breaches like Target. But more pervasively, if it's an SMB, SMBs don't have the ability to defend themselves the same way that a larger enterprise does. They don't have formal IT budgets, they don't have IT staff that are more sophisticated, so they're targeted. 
And when you look at the number of SMBs just in the United States alone, there's 5 million SMBs just in the US. In EMEA, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, there's 22 million. They are primary supreme targets for hackers. So if you're hacked and you're an SMB, 60% of those businesses within the first six months will go out of business. Every year, over 300,000 websites are hacked. Now the number's approaching roughly 30,000 websites per day. It's staggering. 150 million Americans have been hacked this year. Again, this does not include the Equifax breach. We've normalized this out, but 150 million Americans have been hacked this year, and their information is now circulating on the dark web and being monetized. So how do we know what information is out there? What's being transacted on? How much are we worth on the dark web? So when you analyze this, and we take, and we do a lot of work around this in terms of research, bank accounts go anywhere from $20 per account to 1,000, PayPal credentials 20 to 200, and social security numbers used to go for a lot more. But after the recent breach, they're plentiful. Those go for a dollar now. Simple supply and demand issue. Driver's licenses are roughly 20, and you can see here that passports pull the largest at 2,000, up to $2,000 per unit. And then medical records, we're seeing those, the median's right around 500, because they contain everything that a hacker needs to monetize or to access credit or to apply for new credit with your personal identifiable information. First name, last name, date of birth, social security number, um, even medical history is important to them. So this is what we're seeing. So last year, hackers cost companies $445 billion in 2018. We surveyed over 1,000 companies last year, and this is some of the alarming information that we were able to determine, which 81% of breaches are due to weak password security, and this fell right in line with the Verizon study, over 80%. So when there's a breach, it's usually a result of something at the employee level on one of their devices, a smartphone, tablet, computer, sharing a password through email or writing something down on a sticky note or using some means that's unsecure to share and transact on weak passwords. So this includes using passwords that are too short, passwords that don't contain a random set of numbers, letters, symbols, special characters, and reusing the same weak password on multiple websites, apps, and systems. 70% of the workforce digitally share private information. So if I call somebody in IT and I don't have a really good password security strategy at the company and I say I need the password to log into the Atlassian account, how is that going to be shared? Is it going to be through email or Slack or Skype? This is traditionally what's happening. 60% were not concerned about corporate security. Why? Why are employees so distant from corporate security, because there's a paradox problem. Typically, in a company, security solutions that are relegated to employees are viewed as difficult to use. There's a lot of friction. So adoption becomes lower. So we believe that the best solutions out there, the most modern solutions, have to do two things when it comes to cyber. It has to be pervasive. And in order for it to be pervasive, it has to be easy to use, and it has to be secure. And so merging those two things, ease of use and security, is really important. 50% of the populace use personal devices and applications at work. So huge problem. If you don't have a BYOD strategy at your company, how do you govern the data on devices that you don't own, and this is the problem. So for example, our company, we're a cybersecurity company, and we know that we don't provision smartphones to our team members, we don't give them tablets. For all intents and purposes, they have their own phones, they use their phones constantly, their digital lives are on these devices, but we know that they're gonna be transacting on email, 
or calendaring or other means, right? Going to mobile websites and transacting on corporate information. How do we protect that? And there's great technology to do that where you can actually rope in devices that you don't own into your ecosystem and control and lock down the corporate information that's being shared, stored, and transacted on those devices. 45% change passwords only when requested. So if you're, for example, um, a realtor, and you're the National Association of Realtors, there's a mandate that says every 30, 60, or 90 days, you have to rotate your MLS ID password. Well, how do you enforce that? Are you going to make the employee do that, or can you establish something in your system that automatically rotates the MLS ID password and propagates that across all of the relevant devices for those employees that have MLS ID passwords? And that's where the technology comes into play. 80% of all employees were reusing passwords, 80%. So hackers know this, and what hackers do is they dictionary lists of passwords. We did a study a year ago on 10 million stolen passwords, 10 million, the ones that were stolen in data breaches. When we analyzed the list of the top 25 most used passwords, the number one password was 12345, the next one was 1234, password was also one of them. 50% of the time, the top 25 most commonly used passwords in data breaches represented the 10 million populace. That's alarming. And hackers know that, and they also know that 80% of the time, that weak password will be reused on multiple websites, apps, and systems. So if they're able to breach one account, and they go on social media and determine where you spend your time and what services and sites and products you like, they're going to try to replicate those login credentials to breach your other accounts, and most of the time, they're going to be successful in doing that. So a lot of people say, well, you know, privacy is dying. And we don't believe that. At our company, we believe that privacy is dead. And we have to do something about it. We have to become smarter, we have to become more prolific, and we have to become far more pervasive in terms of endpoint security and, and getting people to understand that security products don't need to be difficult or you know, too comprehensive to use. They can be very simple at the end user level. So what's the threat landscape look like? Um, we know that ransomware attacks are growing exponentially. We, uh, we saw that in the massive data breach yesterday uh, in the keynote. And that's growing at more than 350% per year. 61% of breach victims were businesses under 1,000 employees. That's the delineation point. When we do an analysis or a study, 1,000 under is what we call an SMB, larger enterprise, over 1,000 employees. So you can see 61% were small to medium-sized businesses. And the financial damages are projected to hit $6 trillion in just a few years. So this is a histogram that we put together on the data breaches by industry vertical. And you can see that financial services, and this includes banking, advisory, accounting firms, brokerage firms, trading operations, were number one, not surprising. Because hackers today are not so concerned as much as they were 10 years ago about viruses. They're concerned about stealing. Right, so today it's not about so much about antivirus, although yes, that's important. It's one prong of endpoint security. It's really about anti-theft. How do we protect our sensitive digital assets? And then you can see the list down here, utilities and energy, aerospace, et cetera. Aerospace and defense, big one. A lot of IP that's valued there. Yeah, this is in millions, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so with what happened with a week ago, you see with Marriott, that was a, you know, a wide-scale massive breach. That information right there is worth tens of millions on the dark web. So 
This can change quickly, but yes, this is from 2017. So why is this happening? So we all have a target on our back. It's, it's a really interesting problem because, you know, 10 years ago, I was like, you know, when I was a CPA, you know, going in and out of companies, analyzing their businesses and their financial statements and their internal controls, they didn't think about the fact that they were fiduciaries of digital assets. They're in the business of producing automobiles, right, or aerospace, or they're in the food and beverage or hospitality business. But now it's changed. Companies, whether they know it or not, or whether they like it or not, are now fiduciaries, and they have a fiduciary and legal responsibility to protect and safeguard their clients' sensitive digital assets. And that includes inside the company, employee personal identifiable information. By collecting the information, it's our responsibility as business operators to keep it secure. So the real cost, and we, we know this. So the cost of the customer, really straightforward, their identity is taken. We're not seeing, you know, just personal identifiable information that's digital. We're also seeing biometrics being stolen. For example, the Office of Personal Management, U.S. government was a big data breach. So if my password's stolen, not really a big deal. I can rotate it. But what do you do when your password's taken uh, or your fingerprint's taken? You can't change your, your fingerprint or your biometric. So that's the compromised biometrics problem. And then, of course, there's the loss of time. I don't know if any of you have had a breach on a personal level, but when you have to engage, it's, it's time-consuming and it's stressful. So the cost of the organization, the big one that we see is IP. So confidential trade secrets being divested, taken, distributed, and utilized for massive gain on an economic scale that most people can't imagine. Uh, a good example of this was the Nortel breach. When they were under attack, they didn't realize it for nearly a decade. And Chinese companies were popping up, offering essentially the same types of products with a different brand, and ultimately drove that company into bankruptcy. Revenue, lost. Brand trust, lost. So these are, these are the major issues that we see. So when we look at a cybersecurity strategy, and we talk to companies about this, there's really four buckets. Um, and it was mentioned yesterday, but it all starts with prevention. So you've got prevention, you have detection, you have remediation, and you have response, which, which we call reporting. So on the prevention side, it really starts with identity and access management. Identity and access management, really straightforward. Um, we all know what it is, but in general terms, it's making sure that the right people at the right time access the right computer and the right data set based on certain internal controls of your organization. And it's amazing that most companies that we talk to don't fully understand this. There's two sides of the equation. The first equation is, you want to protect the insider threat, right? You want to make sure that an IT admin can't impersonate another user inside the company and access confidential information such as payroll data or tax information when they're not supposed to be there. And if it happens, you want to be able to lock them out. You want to be able to track it. And we hear about this through privileged access management systems. Then on the flip side of that, is the I am strategy to prevent outsider access, the outsider threat. I don't want a remote breach. I don't want a remote attack or a hacker in another country or outside of the auspices of the company violating and coming into the network. And that's across every single endpoint. So the forms of identity and access management, just as you start thinking about and building out the strategies, because these strategies, you know, with the proliferation of all of the technologies and all of the attack vectors out there, you know, continue to grow. So 
We believe that password security is the nucleus of cybersecurity. It has to start with putting a cloak of armor around your password, so password management is super important. The use of multi-factor authentication is very critical. Identity repositories. So a good identity and access management system will have a very strong layer of protection and encryption, not just what's at rest, but based on what's at transit as well. So full end-to-end -end encryption. And then you have provisioning software. Provisioning is, is becoming more sophisticated and elegant at the same time. You don't necessarily want to spend 12 or 24 months provisioning software and getting it to work. There's modern tools now that allow you to provision to thousands of employees in just a few hours. Security policy enforcement, very important. So at the role level or the team level, different people in the organization should have different access rights and privileges to sensitive information. And we want to be able to track and measure that. And then, of course, reporter, reporting and monitoring. So this is uh, becoming more important for visibility over your business. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. So what could proper identity and access management, privileged access management could have prevented? We all know who this is. Uh, here was an example of a global accounting firm that had a public-facing GitHub hosted repo, and hackers got into the network um, through an admin account without too much difficulty. Simple oversight. And unfortunately, we still see Simple things like a sticky note being left on a desk, someone goes to lunch, and the next thing you know, there's a wide-scale breach, low technology. So we have a saying at our company, it only takes one week password to wreck a business or a career. Weak password security is the Trojan horse that can harm your enterprise. We know that 80% of all cyber breaches are a result of weak password security. So we believe that cybersecurity must start with password security. So here's the first problem that we see. If I, we'll just do a, a quick um, hand count. How many of you here, if I ask you, do you know in your company how many of your employees on all of their devices, every smartphone, tablet, and computer that they use, are using weak passwords or the same password for multiple websites, applications, and systems. How many of you have complete visibility and knowledge over that? Nobody, right? And this is, this is a huge problem because one employee device could cause major issues at the company. So here's the second problem, and we call it the security adoption paradox. Too often, there's a problem with the technologies that we're all creating, right? Most of us are engineers, and we create these products with our teams. And we think that the user interface of the product is gorgeous, and it's going to be really easy to use. But the truth is, on a lot of these systems, when we run testing and user testing and we sit with, with focus groups, it's great for DevOps. It's great for an engineer that's used to looking at you know, a screen that has you know, 180 different things on it, and maybe even more. But when an employee gets their hands on it and looks at it on a smartphone, what goes through their mind, like within two seconds? We have to make sure that that experience is frictionless and super painless and easy to use so that they say, oh my god, I want to use this product. It's amazing. It's so easy to use, and it's hyper secure. And that's where the bridge between ease of use, convenience, and security becomes critical because we see that the more secure the solution, unfortunately, the fewer employees want to use it. I'm not talking about DevOps, IT admins. I'm talking about the main populace of all the team members in marketing, finance, HR, accounting, across the gamut. And the less that they use it, unfortunately, we know that the less secure your company is. So what if there's a security solution that made employees so productive 
they enthusiastically used it all day. So if they could transact with websites, faster applications, and systems, where they use it all day. So this is what we've created. It's an enterprise-grade password security solution, and we believe you should not have to compromise between higher security standards or ease of use or enterprise-wide adoption. You can actually have both. This is one of the um, leading financial services firms in the country uh, on this particular um, testimonial. They asked that, you know, we typically don't disclose the name of our customers, but a um, very cost-effective tool for them to deploy this and rave about how great the product was. Um, these are some actual testimonials from employees about the fact that we can bridge ease of use with security. So who are we? Uh, we're a seven-year-old company. Uh, we spent the first four and a half years of our existence building a product for the consumer individual market. Uh, 15 million users used the product globally. And we began selling uh, SMB and, and security software for the enterprise two and a half years ago. Um, we are specialists in advanced security, cryptography, cybersecurity. Um, more than half of our employees are actually cryptography experts or security developers. So we're fanatical about security. We have four offices. Our headquarters are in Chicago, um, Northern California Software Development, Cork, Ireland for EMEA, B2B sales, and we have an office in the Philippines for augmented support. Leaders use our product as a major component of their organization's cybersecurity strategy. Um, here are just some of the um, ratings on the product from B2B application rating agencies. And these are the, really the, the four cornerstones of what we like to talk about, really, is best-in-class security, flexibility, ease of use, and, of course, responsive support. Um, Thomson Reuters is one of our happy corporate customers. And you can see they've got, you know, 800 passwords that they have to protect in vaults across different privileged access and employees on all of their devices. So what's life without Keeper? You saw that most of us here did not raise our hand when we talked about the importance of password security and visibility on the organization. So unknown password strength and reuse across the organization. Until recently, there's no ability to audit password security related to password hygiene. How do we do that? And excessive password-related help desk costs, like how many times are the help desk getting contacted? I forgot my password. Can you help me reset my password? Weak single sign-on security and limited coverage. So we know that SSO solutions, they're awesome for cloud-based applications, but what about native applications? What about metadata protection? Password fatigued employees, another big one. This is why the security is so low, because they just simply can't, from a human perspective, remember that many passwords and use high strength random passwords. So this changes with Keeper. So mandated password strength across the organization that adheres to your internal control policies and framework real-time security, audit score for visibility and immediate remediation, and of course, uh, reduce password-related help desk costs. We strengthen SSO solutions. As, as you know, SSO is for authentication, not encryption. We bring encryption to the SSO and we directly integrate with any SAML 2.0-based SSO solution. And then, of course, you wind up with happy and productive employees on all their devices, and you put that cloak of armor on every smartphone, tablet, and computer with respect to password security. 